Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Brandis Friedman. Paris Schutz is on assignment. On, on the show this evening. They've told this tale that it was really good for consumers. The Public Interest Research Group says it was a tall tale and state laws are costing consumers. The latest with the ComEd scandal. We only saw the United States of America. One on one with the author of a new book about President elect Joe Biden and the challenges that await him. Land markings only protect buildings. A city council committee votes down the controversial Pilsen landmark district proposal. What's next for Pilsen residents? I can't survive this. And a new online exhibit launching today showcases the stories of women living with HIV in Chicago and across the country. But first, some of today's top stories. All but three states now fall under Chicago's emergency travel order, requiring travelers from those states to quarantine for two weeks upon arriving in Chicago. The only three states with fewer than 15 daily cases per 100,000 people are Maine, Vermont, and Hawaii, shown here in the lighter yellow. Additionally, Chicago Public Health Commissioner Dr. Allison Arwady outlined the city's plans to distribute the COVID-19 vaccine if one should arrive in Chicago in the last two weeks of the month. We have plans that will start with, with all 37 Chicago hospitals receiving vaccine for health care workers, not yet for patients. And we have plans for all 128 uh, long-term care facilities in Chicago. That would include both skilled nursing facilities uh, and assisted living facilities. Meanwhile, state health officials report another 12,000 cases of the coronavirus in Illinois and an additional 125 deaths. The state's total number of cases since the beginning of the pandemic is now more than 738,000 and the total number of deaths is 12,403. The test positivity rate sits at 12.2%. With a month to go before the year's end, Chicago police say they've already recovered more than 10,000 illegal guns. As shootings and homicides in the city are up more than 50% for the first 11 months of 2020 compared to 2019. CPD says November's 58 homicides mark the highest total for that month since 2017 and the third highest total since 2000. Still, the department says overall crime is down 7% so far this year driven mostly by a reduction in burglaries and thefts. Utility giant Commonwealth Edison has been in the news since July when prosecutors made the stunning announcement that the company had admitted to a long-running bribery scheme. A new report takes a detailed look at the law at the center of the scandal. Amanda Venicky joins us now with more. Amanda. Friend, is that bribery scheme intended to gain the goodwill of Illinois House Speaker Michael Madigan, who, by the way, denies any involvement or wrongdoing, began in 2011. That is also the year that, that the General Assembly approved the Energy Infrastructure Modernization Grid. Mouthful, I know, so you can just think of it as the smart grid law. ComEd said that the electric grid needed to be updated, but that it wanted first a guarantee it would get its money back before spending all the cash to do that. Since ComEd has a virtual monopoly, the state regulates what it can charge customers. So ComEd worked out a deal with the legislature. It would invest in the grid, make it smart, and in return, Illinois would lift significant regulatory oversight. The new report out from the Illinois Public Interest Research Group says for ComEd, it was a profit machine. What was sold is this kind of need for a very specific set of investments has led to these incredible profits to me really stood out. And uh, one calculation we did is we looked at if they continue to have this automatic rate making authority and they make the investments that Exelon is telling its investors it plans to make. Uh, by 2023, ComEd will make just under a billion dollars in profits each year um, that's all coming out of our bills, and that's pretty incredible. Perg's Abe Scar, who co-authored the report, says the grid did need modernizing, but he says ComEd is obligated to provide a reliable service. It shouldn't need a windfall to do it. ComEd is required under law to provide reliable service. And so it's kind of weird that they would need some sort of fantastic windfall to do it as a basic fundamental obligation of their existence. And, um, you know, if we look at, they have improved reliability, that's a good thing, but that's not the only question we should be asking. The question we should be asking is, did what we pay for that improvement 
uh, make sense? Did we get an actual value out of that? Short answer, he says, no, we overpaid. And as our report shows, uh, a lot of the potential benefits that ComEd promised and that we think could come to fruition through smart grid technology have in fact not come to fruition. And we think uh, changes need to be made so that customers do get more value from the smart meters that they've been paying for, for um, you know, mostly since 2013, 2014. In a statement, a ComEd spokesperson says the smart grid bill resulted in substantial benefits to customers, including record reliability. She also points out that in several years, ComEd requested regulators decrease the rates it charges. The deferred prosecution agreement does not contain any allegations that consumers were harmed by legislation passed in Illinois, the ComEd statement says. Every year, regulators must review and must approve every dollar of investment by ComEd to make sure it is prudent and in customers' interest. But PERG, which was among those that tried to prevent the smart grid law from passing in the first place, is now advocating for a series of changes, among them overturning that smart grid law that changed how ComEd's rates are regulated. It comes as clean energy advocates are also pressing for a massive energy package to prop up renewable energy. The Illinois Environmental Council's Jennifer Walling says discussions are ongoing. We have had leadership from Governor Pritzker who has stated publicly he wants to achieve 100% uh, clean energy by 2050 and has agreed with our goals, but all of the um, spikes and information that we've learned about ComEd and the corruption scandal have set these energy negotiations back. And we hope that, we don't just hope that, we know that there has to be an energy package in 2021. But it's unclear how often the General Assembly will meet in 2021 due to the coronavirus. It's also unclear who will be at the helm of the Illinois House. Speaker Madigan is striving for another term in that powerful post. Today, a 19th House Democrat announced she will oppose him, meaning he does not have the votes. We need to put the distraction that has been created by Representative Madigan behind us and move forward in mending the state of Illinois, Representative Kathleen Willis of Addison wrote in a letter. Now again, Madigan has not been charged and he denies any wrongdoing. Brandis, back to you. Amanda, thank you. In 50 days, President-elect Joe Biden is set to become President Biden. But he still faces an ongoing assault on transition norms from President Donald Trump. It's going to be a very hard thing to concede because we know there was massive fraud. So as to whether or not I can get this apparatus moving this quickly, because time isn't on our side, everything else is on our side, facts are on our side, this was a massive fraud. So how might Biden view the obstacles President Trump is attempting to create? Our next guest has written a new book on Biden released just before the election called Joe Biden, The Life, The Run, and What Matters Now. And author Evan Osnos joins us now. He's also a staff writer at The New Yorker and a former writer at the Chicago Tribune, where he won a Pulitzer Prize for investigative reporting. Welcome back to Chicago Tonight, Evan. Thanks for having me. It's great to be with you. Of course. So what is your reaction then to President Trump not conceding and continuing to fight the election results? Well, look, I think you have to call it what it is, which is just patently false. At this point, this has become a kind of public relations campaign. I think it has as much to do with trying to lay the foundation for the life that Donald Trump wants to have after leaving the presidency. But it's worth just reminding ourselves that the facts are clear, the law is clear, the vote counts are beyond clear at this point and he is maintaining a fiction. And I, I have to say, you know, I spend part of my time talking to foreign diplomats. I cover foreign affairs to some degree, and they are looking upon this with some bafflement. I mean, they are just not used to seeing the United States going through a process in which an outgoing president is not seeking to uh, facilitate the process of transition, but is in fact impeding it. So it's taking a lot of us from getting used to it, I think. Yeah. Uh, so Joe Biden, he's been in Washington for a very long time. When he first ran for Senate just before turning 30, he used his then opponent's age against him at the time, accusing, uh, quote, the old guard of bungling things. But now he's going to be the oldest president to take office. Uh, do you see a little bit of irony there? 
there is an irony. It was, you know, 48 years ago uh, this fall that Joe Biden first won his race for the Senate. And he was so young at the time that he was actually too young to take his seat. He had to wait a few months to get old enough to be sworn in. And at the time, you know, he really regarded himself as the vanguard of this rising generation in politics. The ads that he ran in the newspaper said, Joe Biden understands what's happening now. And he was one of the people who was talking about environmentalism. And I find it, you know, there, there is, in a sense, a logic to it. Because if you talk to him these days, one of the things that he will say, as he said to me, is that he understands that there are a lot of Americans, millions of young Americans, millennials now make up the largest generation in America, larger than his own, the silent or the boomers, that they recognize, he recognizes that they don't look at him and see a person who necessarily understands their concerns and their experience. And he's trying in some way, beginning with his appointments and, and, and through his message to say, I get it. He calls himself a transition president. And that's partly because he wants them to feel like He's not here uh, to, to try to bottle up what they want, but in fact, to try to be a bridge to it. What was he like in his early career? Um, and even now, it seems like he's always, and even then, was striving for the center. He was. It's quite noticeable. If you go back and you look at how he voted in that time and how he talked about politics, there is this through line that runs through his career. I mean, people sometimes will say he's not an ideological person. I would say he has an ideology, and that ideology is centrism. In effect, as somebody who worked with him in the White House, worked with President Obama, said to me that Joe Biden has a nearly perfect weather vane for where the center of the, of the Democratic Party is. And that meant that when he was coming up at that early stage, he represented a district in Delaware. He represented a state that was in many ways both of the South and of the North. And you saw him, and we all remember uh, this came up in the debates, that he became one of the defenders, or sorry, I should say an opponent of court-ordered busing. And he was doing that at the time partly because he was getting a lot of pressure from suburban white parents who were opposed to the busing program. And he then changed his view over time, and you began to see at many different places that he has tried to sense where the party is moving and to try to be there when it happens, not to get left behind by history, but then also not to get out in front of it. So he's worked his entire life uh, to become president. This last time that he ran, third time was a charm. Um, how do you think a Biden administration will be different from an Obama administration? Well, he talks a lot about how he recognizes that the country has changed and the world has changed. I mean, it's interesting. I go back now and remember one of my first interviews with him in 2014 when he was still in the vice presidency. And he said something to me that in retrospect, I was not smart enough to recognize that he was onto something. He said, look, I think the Democratic Party, my party, is not doing enough to recognize the concerns of working people across the country. We, we're, we're just leaving them behind. They're getting crushed, as he put it, by inequality. And that was before the rise of Bernie Sanders. It was before, certainly, the rise of Donald Trump as a political phenomenon. He, he sensed something was happening. And now you fast forward six years, and you are beginning to see in some of his appointments to the cabinet that he's appointing people who are talking about inequality. Heather Boucher, for instance, somebody who he has named as an important economic advisor, is somebody who talks a lot about trying to deal with inequality, more so than Democrats would have even a few years ago. On the foreign policy front, I think they also recognize that the world is not the same as it was when President Obama left office in 2017, particularly the rise of China and a more confrontational relationship with the United States poses challenges that a Biden administration is going to have to deal with. And Evan, you just mentioned it, you know, President-elect Joe Biden today, he uh, introduced his economic team. Here's a little bit of what he said. 11 years ago, President Obama and I entered office during the Great Recession and implemented the Recovery Act that saved us from a Great Depression. I didn't see the map of America at the time, nor did he, in terms of blue states and red states. We only saw the United States of America. We work with everyone, for everyone. And Evan, what do you expect from Biden in the next four years? Can he bring the country back together? It is a, an awesome challenge. I mean, frankly, it's a challenge no incoming president would seek to have that he's facing a country as polarized as it is today. It's at historic levels of division. And what we know are what his instincts tell him. His instincts tell him that it's possible. 
And, you know, he and President Obama shared something in common. They had a lot of things that, were, that made them different stylistically in terms of age and generation. But they both shared this idea that it was possible to unify the, the country. In the beginning of the Obama administration, he was tasked with finding votes to help pass the stimulus bill. Joe Biden called six members of Congress and he got three yes votes and the bill passed by three votes. He believes that it is possible to find common ground even on issues that are really divisive. But this will depend as much on Mitch McConnell, I think, as it does on Joe Biden. Okay. Again, the book is called Joe Biden, The Life, The Run, and What Matters Now. You can read an excerpt on our website. And now our thanks to Evan Osnos. Thanks very much. While the polls closed four weeks ago, the impact of the election is still unfolding. WTTW News Director and Chicago Tonight Latino Voices host Ugo Balta moderated a virtual community conversation last night about the election and its impact on the Latino community. Here's a short clip about what the panelists will be looking for from President-elect Joe Biden and other newly elected officials. The pandemic was a uh, number one issue, especially for voters who went for Biden. So I think we definitely want to see the results of that. COVID-19 assistance, Ugo. Um, cash assistance, housing assistance, uh, assistance to those community orgs, organizations who are doing the, the tough work. Um, I know right now D.C. is 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 deadlock, but seeing some action there. We need to reimagine all elements of our society and systems because what COVID has presented to us is that the, the way we operated before is no longer tenable. And therefore, we need to be ingenious in how we respond and have that long and short term game in mind as we're moving ahead. And you can watch the full conversation on our YouTube channel at WTTW.com slash news or slash voices, excuse me. And be sure to tune into Chicago Tonight Latino Voices when we return Saturday, December 12th at 6 p.m. And mark your calendars for our next community conversation on December 28th, which I will be hosting. And now to Phil Ponce with a look into a community vote, a committee vote over a landmark district in Pilsen. Phil. Brandis, a plan to turn hundreds of buildings in Pilsen into Chicago's largest landmark district reached a landmark rejection today. A city council committee unanimously voted the plan down. This after one of its biggest critics said his constituents asked for an alternative proposal. Long-term residents, new residents, small businesses, everybody has said no to the landmark, but yes to a different route. If this is indeed a new era, then we ought to be listened to our testimonies, people who came and said, we need a different plan. WTTW News reporter Heather Sharon joins us now with more. Heather, first of all, remind us what the plan included and why it was turned down. Well, the plan would have put a landmark designation on about 900 buildings on 18th Street and Blue Island Avenue that would have prevented their owners from making changes to the outside. Now, these were buildings built near the turn of the century uh, in a Baroque style that are very ornate and beloved by people who live in Pilsen. But the fear was is that these buildings would be impossible to maintain, especially by sort of low income, middle income Chicagoans just struggling to get by. That won't happen after today's vote. So what is the next step now that this proposal has been turned down? Well, we heard from um, Alderman Byron Sicho Lopez, who asked his colleagues today to approve a six month demolition ban as he tried to work out that sort of long term plan that was also rejected by the committee. So everything is in a little bit of flux. And I guess you'll have to stay tuned to Chicago tonight and keep reading WTTW News to find out what's next. Thanks, Heather. Thanks, Bill. And you can read Heather's full story on our website. That's WTTW.com slash news. Now, Brandis, we go back to you. Phil, thank you. Today, December 1st, is World AIDS Day. For more than 30 years, it sought to raise awareness of a global pandemic, one that's been largely out of the headlines in 2020. Today is also the launch date of a new online exhibition showcasing the stories of women living with HIV in Chicago and across the country. Chicago Tonight's Quinn Myers spoke with some of the participants and organizers. There was a commercial that came on and it said, if you've had unprotected sex, if you've injected drugs, if you've, uh, 
you, those things there. And it was like the finger was pointing right at me from the TV. And I said, yep, yep, yep. I just kept saying yep to everything they were saying. When I first learned of my diagnosis with the whole package that came with it, um, it, it, of course, I thought I was going to be able to drink it away, drug it away. And that what didn't happen. And I thought I wanted to be suicidal or commit suicide, but I was scared too, so that didn't happen. Marta Santiago and Cordelia, who asked us not to use her last name, are lifelong Chicagoans, having grown up on the West and South sides, respectively. They've also both lived with HIV for decades. Now, their stories of diagnosis, treatment, and community are part of an online exhibition put together by the History Moves Project, based at the University of Illinois at Chicago. It's called I'm Still Surviving, a living women's history of HIV AIDS. The project really allows us to speak with women and have them tell their stories, and in combining their stories together, chart a history of HIV in the United States and to really center the experiences of women and women's history. The exhibition has gone digital because of COVID, and it features recordings and testimonials from almost 40 women living with HIV in Chicago, New York, and North Carolina. I think it's really an important lesson for us to bring to today that we have to understand how women, how the female body um, lives through illness, survives with illness, dies from illness. And we can't just think that studying um, the universal subject of men is going to give us the answer. The project also includes photos showing the role that cities and institutions played in these women's stories and in the larger history of HIV AIDS. One of those institutions is Cook County Hospital, where many women in Chicago received medical care and found a wide range of support groups. And that's what kind of got me back to, uh, I guess you would say, not thinking so negative, not thinking that this was going to kill me and realizing that I can survive this. Today, Cordelia and Marta are both doing well and are eager to share how living with HIV both changed their lives and doesn't totally define who they are. It's kind of an honor uh, uh, to be part of this. And it was like, okay, you know, we could show the world out there and those who are still afraid um, with the impact of HIV, living with it, um, life goes on. It's amazing to know that it's women all over the world that's just like me. And you would never know, you know, because they're still living their life to the fullest. They're still looking healthy, they're still being healthy, and they're still surviving. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Quinn Myers. I'm Still Surviving launches online today in conjunction with World AIDS Day. You can learn much more on our website. Up next, previewing a behind the scenes look at how WTTW News covered a tumultuous year. But first, a check of the weather. A global pandemic, a nationwide racial reckoning, a contentious presidential election. A new WTTW documentary premiering tonight explores how unusual 2020 has been. Making Sense of 2020 follows the WTTW news staff as our team adapted to report these stories, including how community members reacted to racial tensions flaring up in some neighborhoods after protests this summer, some of which turned destructive. Here's a clip. We are standing on the corner on 18th Street, and this woman comes up and gives me a dollar bill, which I thought was really strange, and she walked away. And then about half an hour later, this kid comes up and says, call the number on the dollar bill. My mom wants to talk to you, but she's afraid of being seen talking to the media. We talked about how she was so disappointed in some of the behavior she was seeing in her community, namely prejudice against African Americans, that was invaluable to our reporting, just capturing the tone of the situation. I don't think you earn trust in five minutes. I don't think you earn it in even five months. 
big part of trust is just being there, being present, not necessarily coming in with an agenda. And that's our show for this Tuesday night, abbreviated to bring you, as we just mentioned, the premiere of Making Sense of 2020. You can join the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag MakingSenseWTTW. And don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing, and you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, WTTW.com news. You can also get the show via podcast and the PBS video app. And please join us tomorrow night live at 7. President-elect Joe Biden introduces his economic team with former Fed Chair Janet Yellen tapped to be the first woman to ever lead the Treasury Department. Plus, why some Chicago residents are experiencing major delays with mail delivery. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman. Thank you for watching, stay healthy and safe, and have a good night. Closed captioning is made possible in part by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, wishing all a happy and healthy holiday season.